Oh, morning. It's good to see you guys today. I appreciate you being here. I know this is a holiday Sunday with many, many demands and, and uh, justly so, getting out of town with family and doing things and recreating and, and we would definitely never judge people for that and we, we miss them when they're gone but we know it's just a good time for extended time with family but we appreciate that you guys are here today and and just uh, make yourself at home and we're going to we're going to get you out of here quick today and so we can get down to the park and uh, start enjoying ourselves. I want to tell you a story about a man that most of you've probably never heard of before his name is Gary Princip and uh, Gary was born a long time ago, in 1894. He was born in a place that we would now call Serbia. Um, and Serbia and Croatia and Bosnia and all those areas that you hear about in the news often today, they're just part of a, of a bigger country that was broken up many, many years ago called Yugoslavia, and maybe you've heard of that. And remember the little Yugo cars that used to be out there? How many of you guys remember the Yugos? How many are trying to forget the Yugos? I couldn't get in them myself. So Gary Princip was born in 1894 in Serbia, born to a very poor family. He was an insignificant individual born in an insignificant place to an insignificant family, very poor. There were eight children, and six of the eight children died in their infancy. Gary grew up a, as a young man that was a little bit bitter because he was he wasn't very old when the old Yugo republics were were kind of busted up and and other empires began to to take ownership and and he was just a young man when when Serbia Bosnia Serbia was kind of ended up in the hands of the the Austrian Hungarian Empire and Austria and Hungary were merged together as one empire going into the turn of the century um, and they took ownership of Bosnia and Serbia. And these areas were mostly divided up um, by cultural lines, eth ethnic lines, and a lot of those ethnic lines even were religious lines that were being drawn in the sand. But Gary grew up just a young man that was kind of a little bit bitter. Um, he didn't understand everything that was going on with his country, and he didn't really understand the history. He just somehow didn't think that it was right that some other empire would own his country, even though um, in the big picture, sometimes there's more than meets the eye, and some nations are so poor that unless another nation came in and usurped their authority and took them over, a lot of those nations maybe wouldn't have even made it because there was so much poverty. And that's, that's somewhat the scenario there. So Austria-Hungarian Empire there, it was called the Astro-Hungarian Empire, was ruling over Serbia. And when Gary was 20 years old, a young man that had been in trouble a lot in school, kicked out of school, was always stirring stuff up, um, never could keep his act together. In fact, it was so bad, his father kicked him out of the house. He sent him to live with an older brother. Um, and when Gary was 20 years old, the Archduke of Austria came to visit his small town. It was Ferdinand, what was his name, in case any of you guys want to write this down, Franz Ferdinand. How many have heard of that name before? The Archduke of Austria, and came to visit him and his wife, Sophie. Because they were coming, there were many Serbs that were not happy about the scenario. There was a small group that got together, and Gary was part of that group, but a little bit more on the outside of that group. And they decided that when the Archduke came to visit, um, that they would welcome him by taking his life. And so they began to plot an assassination. And so the plan was there were six of them, and they would stand at different sectors on the street where they knew the Archduke and, and Sophie was going to be driving in their car in a parade procession, and they had hand grenades, and they were going to throw hand grenades at the car. And there were, there were six different little points where people were going to do that, so if the first one missed or the first one got caught or whatever. And sure enough, as the car was driving up the street, the first kid that was in line with a hand grenade just plum chickened out. Later on he said there was a police officer standing behind him and he was afraid he would get caught and he just chickened out. But as the car continued coming up the street, um, the second young man threw the grenade. 
But it landed behind the car, and it blew up, and it injured a bunch of people. At that point, it's just mass chaos, and people begin to disperse, and, and the assassination attempt was completely foiled for the most part. It was over, and the Archduke and Sophie uh, were still very much alive. And the rest of these young troublemakers scattered. Gary went back to his home on his street, and um, lo and behold, as twisted fate would have it sometimes, the Archduke and his wife understood that many people got injured in that blast, and they decided they would go immediately to the hospital and pay their respects to those who were injured in that, in that grenade blast. And the driver didn't really know where he was going, and he just started turning down streets, and lo and behold, he turned down the street that Gary lived on. Gary had a pistol, and one of Gary's friends saw what was going on and saw the car, recognized the car from just a little while earlier in the parade. And Gary was made aware of it as the car came down the street. Gary ran up the street to meet it, and he ran up to the window, and he fired two shots through the window, one hitting the Archduke and one hitting his wife, Sophie, and both of them were killed. That was on June 28, 19. 14. Now I want you to listen to this, to this timeline of how these next series of events began to unfold. June 28th, 1914, one insignificant person, no one would ever know he existed, stepped off the curb into a city street, fired a pistol through the window at a passing car, and killed two people. June 28th, 1914. One month later, on July 28th, just one month later, Austria-Hungary, that empire, declared war on Serbia because of what had happened. Three days later, Russia, who was an ally to Serbia, got into the conflict and they declared war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Two days later, Germany, who was an ally to Austria, entered the war. Germany, who was just looking for an opportunity to take some new territory, wanting to expand their borders, just out of the blue in this thing, not only got in the mix to provide support for Austria, but they, out of the blue, just declared war on France. The very next day, on August 4th, Germany then declared war on neutral Belgium. Belgium was never in the mix. They were always neutral. On that same day before the sun set, England found out what was going on, and England got upset because Germany declared war on neutral Belgium, and England declared war on Germany. And soon a world war begins to unveil itself. Barely over a month, after the actions of one individual, one young, insignificant person, it would seem, barely over a month later, seven nations are at war. It would be almost three years later before the United States would enter that war. The Great War, as they called it then, on April 6, 1917, Woodrow Wilson got a declaration of war from Congress and entered the conflict. The war didn't last long total. It was about four years. But when it ended, 20 million people had lost their lives. Now I know these numbers are actually small compared to World War II. But compared to today's conflicts, quite incredible. Out of those 20 million, there were 50,000 Americans who lost their life um, and millions others throughout this war who were injured and their life was never the same before. World War I. World War I. World War I ended up having multiple nations involved. 20 million people lost their lives. World War I was started by one young 20-year-old man from a country most people had never heard of,
from a poor family, so poor they couldn't even keep their own children in their home. A young man who never had his act together, never was a, a positive mover and shaker in life, never had any great promises for his future. One young, insignificant man, as it would seem, from an insignificant family in an insignificant nation, in one moment in time, launched a world war that killed 20 million people and tens of millions others injured. Cities completely eradicated in places, decimated. It would take years for life to be restored. One young man. The power of ripple effect from one individual. History reminds us is an incredible thing. In 1992, I jumped on a jet with about 40-some other people. Nasty old jet. It's a Russian Airlines called Aeroflot. Did not know till I got home. It, coincidentally enough, never heard of Aeroflot. And while I'm gone, my wife is watching the History Channel, and they do a special on airlines around the world with the worst crash records. And Aeroflot, by far, has the number one crash record. In fact, because of their inland flights on their home turf, almost 10% of their flights were either crashing, crash landing, or making emergency landings. 10%. And on Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., I got on a nasty old stinking jet with the crusade team because communism had just fallen in Russia. And we were one of the first teams to get in there and start doing crusades and planting churches. And life wasn't then like it was today. There weren't cell phones and there wasn't easy access. And so for three weeks, I asked my wife the other day, I said, didn't, didn't I get one phone call in while I was in Russia? And she said, I don't remember. And I was trying to remember, did I even get one phone call in? Because I was laughing because last Sunday after church, um, I left with nine other pastors and we went up on the Greenbrier River for a three-day fishing trip that we do every year. It's an annual pastor's retreat. And we just eat lots of food and hang out. And, and I was laughing because there were several younger pastors there. And as soon as we got up there, it's just like, well, is there cell service here? I need to call my wife. It's, oh, she's going to be all, so upset. I got to call her. And I was just sitting there, the old fart sitting there, you know, just like. And, and then I did, I did call my wife and I had to because my daughter was missing me and freaking out and that had never happened before and I, I hated it but I kind of liked it at the same time that she was crying for me. You parents know what I'm talking about. Um, it was an interesting journey and um, it was actually my first time out of the country and I didn't know what to expect but as we landed there in Moscow at the airport there were still just tanks all over the tarmac and things were, were very much in an unrest because it, it was two months into democracy and these people had no clue what to do with it. It was much like the scenario of when, of when um, the slaves were, were set free and the emancipation of proclamation is set, is set in place and, and slaves are set free in America but nobody knew what to do with their freedom. And it was just a, a big mess because no one knew what to do with their freedom. And, and I watched that play out in Russia. No one knew what to do with their new freedom. No one knew to, what to do with democracy. And there was so much poverty. And everywhere we went, there were shoeless children chasing us around, begging for money. And the people were so hungry. They were so hungry because the church had just been, had been crushed under the heel of communism. And the only churches around were underground churches. And suddenly the, 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 the people of God are, are coming out from underneath the, the city streets in there. They're ready to worship God openly. And everywhere we went for crusades, those old theaters were just packed to the gills. And I went as the piano player slash worship leader. And, and uh, we tried to learn a few songs in Russian, but it wasn't really working. And we were just so excited when we got there because the Hosanna Integrity worship music was, was, was just getting really popular. And it was so popular that even in Russia, they, they really knew the songs. And when we would sing songs like, uh, Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. 
How many of you guys know some of those old songs? They would just sing along in Russian because they knew the tunes. It was a powerful experience. Powerful experience. A great spiritual awakening instantly went into motion. That couldn't have happened without a very brave soul at the helm. And while we know that there were people on our shores very, very involved in making that happen, Ronald Reagan specifically, it still took somebody on that side of the ocean to have the guts to say communism doesn't work and we're not doing it anymore. His name was Boris Yeltsin. And he flies under the radar, surprising a little, just a little bit. You know, we think of Gorbachev, and he was just like, he's the one that everyone remembers as this, this great presidente of, of Russia, and yet we keep forgetting he was the communist dude. But there was a little shaking going on there with him, but it wasn't until Boris Yeltsin became president that he stood up in front of a nation that only knew one way of life, many adversaries towards the concept of capitalism and democracy. And he drew the lines in the sand and he said, we will no longer be a communist nation. 1992, that happened. Boris Yeltsin through many, many interviews and even when he came to America and he was on many shows with like, like 20, 20 many shows and, and, and they would ask him so often, where did you get such great inspiration to stand in the face of such great opposition and declare communism is over in this nation? And he was very quick to give credit to a man named Lech Volwenza. Lech Volwenza was elected president in 1989 in Poland. Communist Poland. Lech Wałęsa uh, understood communism doesn't work. Lech Wałęsa understood what a lot of people in America still don't understand. Socialism looks good on paper, but in real life, it will crush a nation. Lech Wałęsa understood that, and he declared in 1989, communism's over in Poland. He actually ran on that platform against a communist regime, a nation that had only known communism for so many years, and he stood on that platform, and the people supported him, and they said, yea and amen, we agree with you, communism needs to end. And Boris Yeltsin said, my inspiration came from Lech Wałęsa. If Lech Wałęsa could stand up and declare communism is over, then why can't I? Well, Lech Wałęsa had written a book. And uh, in this book, Lech Wałęsa talked about his motivations and his inspirations. In his book, he cited his primary inspiration. It was Martin Luther King Jr. He studied the history of America in that period of time and he saw the power of what one man can do when one man stands up and says, there's some things wrong here, and it needs to be made right. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired Lech Wałęsa, and Lech Wałęsa inspired Boris Yeltsin. But anyone who followed Dr. King knew where the primary thrust for his inspirations came from when he went from somewhat low key to very high key with his voice. Happened one day in Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, December 1st, a little lady got off work from her depart department store. She was a seamstress there helping keep the clothes in order and she was tired and she got on the bus to ride home. And uh, she was used to doing this every day. She was used to the system when you get on the bus. The first four rows of seats on both sides were white only. Starting with rows five on back, blacks could sit there unless the first four rows filled up and more whites got on the bus. And then the blacks starting with verse 
five, with, with row five was supposed to get up and start moving back and stand and give the white folks their rightful seat. Now, Rosa Parks wasn't happy about this system. In fact, she had gotten in a little bit of hot water a couple times before. A lot of people don't really talk about that. Historically, they act like that was the first day this woman just said, forget it, enough is enough. But there had been a couple times that Rosa had stirred up a little bit of a stink. She was 42 years old. She was just at that age where she could see the big picture of life, and she was just getting tired of some things. That day on the bus, she was probably remembering a familiar time in her life just a few years earlier. In fact, she talked about this in many interviews through the years. When she got on the bus and, and she took her rightful seat, but white folks kept getting on the bus and the bus driver made her get up and in fact, he told her, he said, you need to, he got so mad, he said, there was a back door and a front door on the bus, and if memory serves me correctly, he said, you need to, to get off this bus and go, because he was mad, because she got on the front door, this was a bus that, she's black, she's supposed to get in, in through the back door, she got on the front door, the bus driver was already upset, now she needs to give her seat up, the bus driver said, you need to get off, you need to get off this front door, you came in and go around and get on the bus, the back door, the way you're supposed to, and she never forgot, because that day she was a little more humble and she got off the bus. She went walking down the length of the bus to get on the back door. And as soon as she got off the bus, the bus driver closed the doors and he took off and he left her. And I bet she was thinking about that that day. And she sat down in row five. There was an open seat. That was her seat. It was color coordinated. She saw it. That's my seat. And she sat down. And the driver made a couple more stops and more white people got on the bus. And he looked up in the mirror and he said, you four people in these two seats, you need to get up. Three of the four got up and stood up and one of the four did not. And she just sat there and she stared in front of her and she wouldn't move. She wouldn't move. She wouldn't move. Bus driver said, if you don't get up, I'm going to call the police and have you arrested. She said, then you better start calling. She wouldn't get up. Everyone's familiar with that very historic day now. That was the day that when Martin Luther King Jr. heard that story, he decided if that little 42-year-old seamstress can stand her ground, literally sit her ground in this situation, God has given me a voice to stand up and speak for these people. And Martin Luther King Jr. always talked about what a great inspiration Rosa Parks was to him. Here's the funny thing historically, and I don't think there's really hardly any historians that ever put these kind of ripple effect things on paper and go, wow. They do timelines, they do these chronological orders of events, but I don't think that most historians know how to set and look at the fingerprints of God and the ripple effect power of human beings. And what they don't see is that the day that Rosa Parks refused to stand up, that day, communism toppled. It just took 37 years. It was a ripple effect. It was a, a stone dropped in the water that day. And the ripple effect went out there 37 years. And it was still producing it produced in Martin Luther King Jr., which produced in Lech Wałęsa, which produced in Boris Yeltsin. The ripple effect of the actions of insignificant human beings. Gary Princip proves that a human being, one human being that appears to be very insignificant, with their life can launch an incredible ripple effect that can be very devastating to millions. Rosa Parks proved that one insignificant human being can launch a ripple effect where millions can be set free. The power of ripple effect 
Last Sunday, we launched this new season called Ripple Effect. And we talked about the sowing and the reaping and the harvest process of God. And God saying, I will not be mocked here. Don't deceive yourself. A man is scattering seed everywhere he goes in life. And it will produce. If it's unrighteous seed, it will produce a harvest of unrighteousness. Just ask Gary Princip. But he says, don't get tired of sowing righteous seed. Because in due time, it will produce a harvest. God said, you will not change this natural law of order that I have put into the system of creation. The law of sowing and reaping. The law of ripple effect. I wonder if that's what Moses saw and what Moses was thinking about when he, when he wrote Psalm 90, and I've used Psalm 90 so many times at funerals because it begins talking about how the man is much like the grass of the field and, and, and we spring up and we're, we're nice and green and, and, and we just, it looks so good. Don't you love this time of year? There's, just a, there's a, a green effect to vegetation this time of year that by mid-July we, we've already lost that it. it's gone. And I love just the, the fresh this time of year. Moses talks about how we're like the, the grass of the fields and, and we'll spring up. And then the sun will come out and begin to bake us and the winds will begin to blow and it'll begin to, to dry the grass out. And before you know it, it's over. He was talking about that and comparing it to the years that man has on the earth. And then he makes this statement in Psalm 90. He says, the length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. Why? There's context here. For they quickly pass, and we fly away. By the way, how many of you guys know that's where the song came from, we fly away? Now, if you thought that I didn't like that song, because I don't like the concept of, of people just like flying around all over the place, and it just makes me a little nervous, I want you to understand it's a, it's a death song. And it makes no sense to come into a congregation and sing, I'll fly away, oh glory. I ain't ready to go. <laughs> and won't be for a long time. So I don't want you to sing that song. So that's where that song came from. Put that back up. Because I was only half done. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? Now I want you to understand because we read the, these verses in, in, in the Psalms and they would seem very disconnected to the untrained eye. But there's always context. And when there's a writer like Moses, there's, there's very clear context. And you look at the whole sandwich, you begin to understand it. Because he begins talking about in the Psalm, it's like, man, it's just like life is so short. It's like James said, we're like a mist, man, and it just we're gone. He's saying, man, it's just, he says, it's really hard because it's over so quick. How many of, of us can relate to that today? And then he says, because of that, there's an accountability and there's a responsibility. He says, who knows the power of your anger? Why, God? Why would you make Because of the way that you're living your life. For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. So teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What's the context? The context is, Lord, teach us how to expend our lives wisely, greatly. Teach us, Lord, and give us this understanding that there's a ripple effect, that we're always scattering seed with the words that we speak, with the things we're putting our hands to. How we're living our days as a husband and a wife and a mother and a father and a child and a master and a servant as a child of God are not. He's saying, God is holding us accountable. He loves us. He gave His life for us. But we're just like Daddy. We have our children and we hold them accountable to do something with their life. Something that matters. My priority in life right now is not pastoring Cornerstone Family Church. It is being Hannah's Daddy. Because if I'm successful here and I fail with her, I have failed. 
My primary job in life is to convince that child to do something great with her life, to help her understand there is a ripple effect if you stay in school, if you don't stay in school. If you're nice to people, if you're not nice to people. If you're generous, if you're not generous. If you're obedient or you're not obedient. If you serve God or you don't serve God. If you serve God with a whole heart or you serve God with, God with a half heart. There's consequences. There's a ripple effect to life. And Moses is looking back at his life when he's writing this. And Moses is battling some regret because he displeased God in some areas. When God was trying to teach him the power of life and death in the tongue. And he said, don't strike that rock with your staff this time. I want you to speak to that rock. I want you to understand you're made in my image. You're just like me. There's power of life and death in your tongue. Speak to that rock. Say, water come forth. But Moses was like a lot of Christians. He couldn't break out of his rituals. He couldn't break out of his, his church culture. And he couldn't try something new. He couldn't stretch and grow. And so he did it the way he was always used to doing it. And God said, you're fired. I can't use you anymore. He said, I'm replacing you. And he began to raise Joshua up to take his place. And when Moses died, the Bible says he was in great health. God just said, you're out of here. Can't use you now. God still loved him. He's with God right now. God still loved him. God is just saying, saying, dude, there's going to be a very negative ripple effect that's going to flow out of this now into my people. And sure enough, the whole generation had to die on the desert floor. That was the generation of Moses. The ripple effect. The ripple effect. The ripple effect of life. These stories that I've shared with you today may seem very distant to you. You may see these as names in the, in the history books. Gary Princip, which most of you probably never heard of before. Rosa Parks, which most of you have heard of before. And you say, but those were great people in history or not so great people, but still in history. And the point that I was stressing that I hope you were getting was these were people from environments cultures, backgrounds, families that you would never think about the ripple effect of their life touching anybody beyond their own world. For every one of us in here today, there's a ripple effect for our lives. It matters how we're living our life as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a human being, as a child of God. And I, as I told you last week, the, the, the good news is, is that, that, that God, through His grace, if there's a negative ripple effect through grace, God has given us the ability to right the wrongs and to redeem time even. But we need to understand today, there's only two things that we're doing that's causing ripple effect. It's action and reaction. And the Bible would consider both of those the same probably. Actions with ripple effect. Reactions with ripple effect. And they don't just touch our lives in this room today, they touch our children's lives. And they won't just touch our children's lives, it'll touch their children's lives, your grandchildren. And it just won't ripple effect into their lives, it'll keep going and keep going and keep going. And while the history books may not write about most of us, there will be family conversations about us. And how... The lineage of our family was decided by the ripple effect of our actions and our reactions. I want to say two things to you today before I pray for you. The first is you need to raise the game when it comes to your actions in life. What I am talking about right now is not a heaven and hell issue. It's not about are you saved or are you not saved. It's not about God throwing you away or keeping you. If you're a child, a child of God, you're a child of God. And because of God's great gift of free will, you get to choose. But you need to understand, if you were here last week, God said, but I'll not be mocked in this. You will reap what you sow. And I thank God that His grace cushions that. If I have reaped if I would reap everything I've sowed as bad seed, I wouldn't even be standing here today. So thank God for grace to cushion it. 
but it cushions it to the point that we can still learn the lessons and hopefully grow from it. And there are times that we don't, and it ends up crushing us underfoot. And the price is paid for years to come. We need to be aware of our actions. We need to be aware of that. Our reactions. We need to be aware. God is holding us accountable. Moses said, said I fear the anger of God if I do not use wisdom in how I'm living my days. Be aware, your life has a ripple effect. The second thing I want to leave with you is very similar to last week. I want you to clearly understand, and most of you can relate to this, when there's a really bad ripple effect from our life, sometimes some of that can't get redeemed. But I want to remind you with the simple turning of a heart, simple humility, simple acknowledgement of your ripple effect, taking ownership of it and giving it to God with all humility. God is a God who specializes in bringing beauty out of ashes. See, I got good news because most of y'all sitting there, well, that's too late for me. I done threw the rocks in the, in the pond and the ripples out there and I can't retrieve it now. It's hard to retrieve the ripples, isn't it? But with simple humility and repentance, God has a way of retrieving ripples. And it's not that he can retrieve them all because sometimes, yes, the damage is done. And sometimes we just have to live with things we've done. Paul, probably the thorn in his side, that he was such a persecutor. And he said, God, please take this torment away. And God said, no, my grace is going to be enough. I'm going to get you through this, but I'm not going to let you forget who you used to be. Because you might return back to that. And you might get all caught up in your own strength and think you're all that. I need you to remember who you were before me. God, That's all God's business with you. That's not my business with you. It's not anyone else's business with you. That's God's business with you. Um, God brings beauty out of ashes. And I've thrown a bunch of rocks in the water that caused a bad ripple effect. And didn't know how to retrieve it. Wanted to retrieve it so bad. But let me tell you what I've learned. That if you will humble yourself and you will give it to God, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called to Him. All things, all things, capital A, capital L, capital L. He brings beauty out of ashes. The first thing He shows us in creation, He takes chaos, darkness, void, and out of that He begins to speak into it and He produces fruitfulness. Trees that are producing fruit, that's producing fruit, and, and just a beautiful, light, sunny environment and a beautiful, beautiful garden and a day of rest and peace. God's saying, bring me the extreme of your bad ripples and watch what I can do. Watch what I can do. I want to pray for us in those two areas today. I want to pray that, that today we would leave here more aware and with some longevity Stay aware of the ripple effect of our lives. And be like Moses. Walk in fear and trembling of that. Walk with great reverence in that. We need to learn to reverence our own days. It matters what we say to people. It matters how we say it. It matters how we're raising our children. It matters how we're being married. It matters how we're serving on our jobs for someone else who was nice enough to give us a paycheck. It matters how we treat employees. It matters how we're living our spiritual lives and how we're connecting with God in the local church. It, these things matter. They matter. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will give us an acute, uncanny awareness of that like we've never had that will not dissipate by the end of today. And second of all, I want to pray for anyone here who would say, but Pastor Scott, I've thrown some really big old rocks in the water and they cause some really bad ripple effects and everything in me longs to go back to the day I threw that rock in the water and retrieve that rock and hope the ripples come sucking back out of there with it, but I know I can't. I talk to people as a pastor all the time. For 18 years, my heart has broken for people who've come to me and have done some things that would just, you just wanted to kick their butt all over the place. You did what? 
but then you hear their sorrow and you hear, the, hear their regret and your heart becomes a little bit like God. It's like, boy, I know. Because ain't nobody in here that doesn't know what that's like on some level, right? Anyone here ever regretted throwing a rock in the water? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the stories. I want to pray for you. The Holy Spirit will just teach you how to humble yourself, lay your life in the hands of God, and let Him redeem the days, the lost time. Let Him redeem what the, what the, what the locust has devoured. God said, I'll restore it to you. How beautiful is that? How comforting is that? That when we can't retrieve our ripples, God says, you know what? Yeah, we can't retrieve the ripples, but watch what we can do with these ripples. Why don't you stand with me this morning? I thank you today, Father, that First of all, that you've given us that bittersweet gift of free will. Now, Lord, we love our free will, except there's, unless it's something we can't control and we want you to control for us. And it doesn't always work that way. And we're growing up and beginning to understand that. And that paints us in the corner, Lord, because it brings us to a sense of accountability for our own life, our own actions, our own words. And it's a heavy weight, Lord. And I suspect it's supposed to be a heavy weight according to Moses, a very heavy weight. And so, Lord, we recognize without the leading of your Holy Spirit, without the conviction of your Holy Spirit, without the wooing of your Holy Spirit, without all those works of the Holy Spirit going on in our lives, Lord, um, we're just not capable of living our lives in a way where there's not going to be a lot of negative ripple effect. So we ask, Lord, that you make us acutely aware of our actions and our words and what we're doing every day. Lord, help us to see the picture beyond that moment. Lord, I know Gary Princip never saw past that moment when he fired that pistol through that window. He never saw a world war and 20 million people dying, and yet that was the ripple effect. Help us to see and understand the same kind of things are happening with our life and heighten our sense of awareness. And Lord, for the many that are here, and Lord, because I know, uh, I know my life, I suspect it represents many, Lord, that are here today that has at least one or two or three or four or five things in their life where they're thinking, I threw those rocks in the water, and oh, the ripple effect, the trickle-down effect. Oh. And they don't know what to do, Lord. They hate it. They, they're sorry. They're filled with regret. And they're working hard to try to redeem it themselves to no avail. <laughs> Lord, we need you to jump in the middle of that. And we're not going to ask you to do anything with that that you already have not promised that you would do with that. So we're saying, Lord, thank you that you will do that. But Lord, we've dropped the ball because we have not allowed you to do that because maybe we were ignorant about it or we just didn't have the faith to let you or we were battling so much guilt and shame and condemnation we wouldn't let you. But today, Lord, we're telling you we're going to let you. We're going to take all that ripple and we're going to put it in your hands and we're going to say, here, Lord, it's yours. May it bring back in, pressed down, shaken together, running over some good stuff for us, Lord. I thank you for these people today, Lord. Lord, we're in a topic that we can all relate to. We're not talking about something here where just a few can say amen to or ouch to, Lord. We're, we're in a season now, Lord, where every person that comes into this sanctuary will say, this is so relatable to my life. Holy Spirit, you have sanctioned this season, I believe. Help us to maintain a sense of hearing and continuity in getting here and hearing this week after week so that you can build this new lifestyle of awareness in us, Lord, that we can become intentional about our sowing and reaping, that, Lord, we will continually have harvest coming back in that makes our life better, not worse. We give the rest of this day to you, Lord. You were here with us today as we worshiped you, and you were here as we preached your word you're going to be just as there with us lord as we picnic so come go on a picnic picnic with us lord and lord i don't ask that much for myself but i ask that you would be on my volleyball team today <laughs> lord you know that i am much more holy than these and surely lord you want to be close to holy ground 
I'm sorry. I, I, I repent of all that. Last few sentences. Let's get out of here. I love you guys. Bless you. Go in peace.